Senate Chamber. Okay, thank you, members. And I now declare the meeting open to the public online. Um, I'd like to welcome members who are participating by video conferencing today to enable us to maintain the social distancing guidelines. And today our members online are Paula Bradshaw, Pam Cameron, Pat Sheehan and Jonathan Buckley. And thank you members for that. Can I remind all members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? So we have full attendance today. Um, in terms of chairman's business, chairperson's business, um, just to, to reiterate the concern that is out there in terms of the pressure on the health service, in terms of rising case numbers and the dangers that really uh, we face on both of those fronts, both on people's own lives and, um, and, their, and their relations going into a very difficult Christmas period. And I would just urge everyone to do everything they can personally and collectively to try to reduce their contacts, maintain social distancing, washing hands and wearing masks. We do all of our responsibility here to try to give our health service the best Christmas it can in, in, in light of the pressures that they are under. And they are under massive pressures. I think we're all seeing that very clearly. So um, I just ask everyone to, to think very, very carefully about that in, in the next couple of weeks. Moving on there to draft minutes, members. Item three, I refer you to draft minutes of the meeting held on the 8th of December, which are tab 3.1 of your pack. And I also refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 10th of December, which are tab 3.2 of the meeting pack there. Are members content with the minutes? Yep, members content. Thank you, members. There are, are no matters arising from those minutes um, then, uh, members. So, members, we do have an additional item, agenda, agenda item today, which is COVID-19 regulations on the restrictions for Christmas. And if members are content, uh, we could maybe move to that section and then we we'll come back to the departmental briefing. Um, are members content that we go to that? Yeah. Thank you, members. We have, uh, we have provided um, approximately an hour in terms of the timing in relation to this section um, uh, for members to discuss these regulations, if necessary, um, but we'll see how that goes. I can advise members that we have an official today from the Executive Office here to brief the committee on the easement of the health protection regulations during the Christmas period. No briefing paper has been supplied to date, but the document at tab 17 of table papers was taken from the NA Direct website. May I also draw members' attention to several items of correspondence from concerned individuals regarding the Christmas period at tab 12.11 and tab 12.14 of your pack, and to correspondence from the Minister regarding visiting in care homes over the Christmas holidays, which is contained at tab 12.9. There is a further item in table papers at tab 12.27 on the same subject. So I would now like to welcome to our meeting this morning for the first time, I think, is Karen Pearson from the Executive Office. Uh, thank you for joining us, Karen. And could you please go ahead and brief the committee on these regulations? Thank you. Well, thank you, Chair. Thank you for this opportunity for you today. Um, I'm getting feedback. Can you hear me all right, Chair? It's not. Uh, there was a bit of break, a bit of disruption on it there. It seemed okay the second time you spoke, but the first time you spoke, it it was. Do you have a headset, Karen, that you can use, or? I I don't. Is, is that better? I think it is, you know, I think it is. Try it there to see I, how. We'll, we'll, we'll carry on. Um, so to introduce myself, I work in the executive office in support of First Minister and Deputy First Minister and the executive more widely on the management of COVID-19. Um, very glad of the opportunity to appear before the committee and just to say thank you for taking me higher up the agenda today. It's, it's much appreciated. The committee had asked for a briefing on Christmas arrangements, and I was just going to walk through the development of the policy, Chair, and then very happy to take some whatever questions the committee has. So the, the policy development um, had two key aspects to it. The first decision point was Monday the 29th of November, where ministers from the four administrations attended COBRA. The decision was taken by each administration separately recognising devolution settlements, to operate a five-day period between the 23rd and 27th of December, where three households could meet inside. The First Minister and Deputy First Minister attended, and they had briefed and discussed the issues with their executive colleagues in advance. 
So this is very much a temporary arrangement. It's intended to recognise the importance and significance of the festive period for families and friends and neighbours. It was taken with great care and obviously public health advice was um, very much um, part of the decision making process. So the decision um, also included a specific arrangement for us here to acknowledge that travel issues within the administrations are different, but we have very specific connectivity and capacity issues for um, ferries and airlines. Um, so there is a great period of one day either side of 23rd and 27th to enable people to travel from and to here. The second decision point for all administrations concern the pre precise configuration of the households because the baseline arrangements are different in each administration. So for us, our arrangements currently are that two households may form a linked household, but in doing so, meetings indoors must be limited to no more than 10 people. That's our baseline. So we then had to look at what arrangements we wanted for Christmas and the executive reached a further decision on that. And the decision is that three households can meet. And by that, we mean exactly that, three households, but one household can bring their existing linked household into the arrangement. And we understand that that is complex. Um, and that's why there's material and hopefully a good graphic upon NI Direct, just to guide people on what that means. Um, ministers were very mindful that the baseline arrangements were put in place to help avoid isolation and to provide help and support between households. And the executive is concerned about vulnerable and isolated people, and that's been a concern right through the, uh, the epidemic, and it was instrumental in the development of the linked household model. So in reaching the decision for Christmas, the executive was concerned and worried that it's not going to be possible for all families and friends to see everyone they would normally want to see. And some people will be left out. And that's that's just really sad and unfortunate. Um, so the executive in its decision process did look at and note the support arrangements that are in place for vulnerable people. Um, and those arrangements can be found on NI Direct as well. So, Chair, the decisions were very difficult because they were taken against the backdrop of COVID-19 positive case numbers. Technically, it would have been possible to make no changes, but there was a really important calculation in play. If there's no easement over the Christmas period, the executive was concerned that we might see widespread lack of compliance, even by people who do not break the rules. Um, people need a, a framework against which to then take very careful and specific decisions that are suitable and relevant to their family circumstances. And uh, as of today, it's unfortunate that the positive test case numbers are not where we want them to be. So it's natural that care continues to be taken, that the issues continue to be discussed. I have no doubt that will be uppermost in the minds of the executive today as well. Um, so there have been ongoing decisions, uh, discussions this week across the administrations, and we are looking at whether we can put further guidance out, um, hopefully later today. So the message remains that five days and three households are an enabler. They're not a suggestion that people should maximise those arrangements. Should definitely be seen a framework from within which people will know what the law is and have guidance specific to the Christmas period. Thanks, Chair. I'm very happy to take any questions. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Um, and I suppose my question would be, um, and I have to say, you know, whenever we, whenever this this was um, announced, as like every family and like many families, I suppose. We considered it among among ourselves, um, and it's quite a large family of us. And we had actually came to the conclusion that, given how far we had travelled and how careful we'd been in order to protect our parents and all of that, that we wouldn't actually avail of this. Now I recognise our situation is not everyone else's situation, but my question arising from that, I suppose, what consideration was given to the need for a review, given what the situation would be, and we 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 have to recognise that we are very clearly in quite a difficult situation in terms of pressure on the health service, in terms of raising, continuing raising case numbers. So what consideration was given to how this might be reviewed closer to the time? Um, I suppose my answer to that, Chair, was there was no formal review built into the, the process for this decision, but the executive can always come back to consider matters. I think at the moment, guidance is probably preferable, and we are looking at what more we can say to really exactly the same thing that you've just said there about your family circumstances, Chair. I think everyone needs to go through that step by step 
with everyone that they might have wanted to see. Um, think about particular vulnerabilities, clinically vulnerable people, and just take very great care and just come to a family agreement on it. So the, the executive has provided a framework, but this is very much about individual choice, individual responsibility. And I would just add there that it's not just about that five days. It's, it's from here on in now. It's what can we do to limit our social contacts? How do we then conduct ourselves in that five-day period? And then what do we do immediately after? Because we're going to ask people to um, take great care into that um, post-Christmas New Year period as well. If they have been mixing, then we really need to think about going back to limiting our social contacts immediately afterwards. But as you say, you know, the case numbers are... Um, just deeply worrying. I, I heard your opening comments on NHS. That's exactly what the executive would want to see, that people weigh all those factors in uh, and make decisions that they can um, that, that they can manage safely within the framework. Okay, and the second one from me then, Sharon, is when, when do they intend to make the actual regulations? Chair, we're hoping to do that today. Um, we would have liked to have done it slightly earlier, but last week, focus for and into the early part of this week was getting last week's um, uh, executive decisions on um, lifting restrictions over the line um, and that had to be the priority. Um, we hope it was helpful that the guidance went out on NI Direct before the regulations were made um, the executive communicated its decisions but we understand people want to see the legal framework as well and we're trying to get that done today. Okay, and I'll go to members now, but just as opposed to give members the context of that, so we are not officially uh, considering the regulations today because they're not made, but we thought that members would appreciate a chance, given the urgency of the immediacy, given we were heading into Christmas, the opportunity to engage on, on this issue. So I will go then to, first of all, to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron, and then go back on the phone to Paula, and then in the room to Jerry, and then Cara. That's who I have at this point in time. So I'll go ahead, uh, back to you, Pam. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Karen. Really do appreciate the, um, you giving us some time today, not just for us as a committee, but even just in terms of um, uh, some extra additional information for the public out there. Hopefully, this will this will be covered and uh, the information shared. So, obviously, I think we all have very serious concerns of, about what's to come um, in the next number of weeks, and I think this is a really good opportunity just to reiterate how important it is people uh, do restrain their, their movements at this time and really try to um, help like, the health services as best they can um, in limiting contact as much as possible. But, but obviously, we're all very aware that uh, people desperately feel the need to get together, especially around this time of Christmas. So we understand the difficulty um, in coming to these decisions. Um, I suppose a couple of questions for you. There is a huge concern around the the public that they are switched off or suffering from COVID fatigue, and really, are, many people are not interested or feel like they can't deal anymore with the subject and don't want to listen anymore to advice or to press conferences. Um, so, what is in place and? this is critical and especially in terms of time but what's in place to raise awareness around um all of the regulations to come in terms of the the bubbling at christmas and um will you be really emphasizing that the the alliance of the three households or the three bubbles is not a target that people need to hit but that that, that simply that they will not be criminalized you know, if they do choose for the three households to come together for that period of Christmas, that's my first one. And and then a quick one on whether there's any early data um, available on the uptake of rapid testing um, for universities and uh, the positivity rates out of that. So thank you. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Um, your first point is, is exactly spot on. That's exactly the concern that, that people are... Um, not necessarily adhering to everything we want them to do. So it was really important that we got the guidance out on the NI Direct ahead of the regulations. And you, you're absolutely right. Um, three and five is not a target. It's an enabler. Um, and we want everyone to take their decisions really carefully and really balanced. Um, we want to get a couple of extra points over as well, that the more time you spend together in that three and five, in whatever configuration, the higher the risk. So we're also asking people 
to just spend the shortest amount of time together and in, in the smallest groups possible. Um, and in that in domestic settings, it can sometimes just be easy to forget the the essential public health advice. I know the committee has stressed on an ongoing basis, wash your hands. Um, ventilation can be overlooked. The importance of ventilation, absolutely vital. So if you can meet your bubble outdoors, that's better in gardens. If you can go for a walk, that's better. Good exercise as well. But if you're indoors, open the windows, refresh the air. Uh, uh, that's so important. Um, and uh, re we're really glad of the opportunity to come into the committee today to make that particular point because the ventilation point is so important. We do hope there'll be a bit more guidance coming out, um, hopefully today as well, just uh, re-emphasising those points. Um, on your second point about university data, I'm involved in the um, communication to students around that, but not in the testing programme, Deputy Chair. So I'm afraid I don't have that information, but I can certainly arrange for it to be provided to the committee. That would be much appreciated. Thank you. OK, Pam, anything further for now? No, no that's me for now. Okay, thank you. So I'm going then to Paula Bradshaw. Paula, your questions, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Karen, for your um, for coming to committee today. I've got some some sort of quick questions for you, and they're really in, in terms of just um, restrictions. Can you talk to us about what's happening with churches over the Christmas period? Um, brass bands, for example, doing outside sort of. Um, uh, performances to try and sort of lift people's spirits and also then those charities that would provide Christmas dinners for people who are on their own. What What is the guidance and what's the regulations in relation to, to that um, Christmas day? Thank you. Thank you. Um, in terms of churches over the Christmas period, the regulations are as they are currently drafted until and unless the executive returns to that issue and I, I, I couldn't um, uh, predict or preempt what the executive um, may wish to do in that space. It is as it, as it is today. In terms of brass bands, I think that there has been a slight change to guidance in relation to that. Um, I don't have that to hand, that would be DFC. But again, I can arrange for the committee to be updated if that helps. Uh, and sorry, your third point? Um, sorry, it was in terms of the charities who put on Christmas dinners to people who are on their own and vulnerable at, the, at that time. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mentioned in my opening comments that the, the executive was very concerned about vulnerable people and they asked officials to have a look at that particular issue. That's a work in progress. We know people will want clarity on it, but it's something the executive was, was very concerned about and asked us to look at. And, and we'll update you further on that one as soon as we have a policy position. But it's very much at the heart of the of, of the decision the executive took that there would be people who would be on their own and vulnerable. Okay. Sorry, can I just come back then? Are you, are you suggesting that the, the executive themselves might even be also looking at what is happening on Christmas Day itself in terms of in terms of that, or do you think that will just run right through with the current position? Well, until and unless the executive um, takes a different view, then the arrangements for places of worship are as they currently are in the regulations. So that, that was dealt with on um, Friday the 11th, I believe. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So I'm going across then to Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Karen, for your presentation. Uh, you're very much obviously welcome today, but I think it would have been disappointing if we hadn't had somebody uh, briefing us before Christmas around these regulations. And I think um, yourself or somebody from your team, uh, uh, certainly my view, um, that you need to be uh, briefing us more regularly on these uh, regulations. Um, Karen, um, how would you address the concern that people have, um, the feel that the regulations are hard to follow? There's a bit of an in-out approach, um, you know, the circuit breaker, lockdown and lifting. Um, do you accept that people who want to follow the guidance, want to protect their loved ones, are finding it very, very hard to follow um, the lead from the executive on this, especially as there seems to be last minute decisions and decisions changed or decisions uh, possibly uh, change and do you accept that it's hard for people to, to stay on top of all that? I, I certainly accept that the um, there have been a number of changes throughout this, but that reflects COVID is not something that can be um, predicted. It can be modelled and decisions have to be taken. I would say that where the executive has had to come back and make decisions and where that's been the case, 
we've tried to get um, guidance onto NI Direct in um, reader-friendly way as quickly as we possibly can. But yes, it's complex. Um, the, the, the law is complex. We do try to keep it simple for, for everyone. Um, in terms of this particular one, I would just note, um, Committee, that the executive went out and put the information up, I think, around about the 4th of December. And that was because they wanted people to be able to understand it and follow it. Most people want to follow this and they want to get it right. And we've got to help them with that. Um, so uh, I hope it's welcome that that went up early um, in advance of the regulations. And that's why FM and DFM were very, very happy for me to come and brief the committee today because they, they understand the importance of, of communication and helping people be on the right side of this. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think the, the communication is welcome today, but like I said, I think it should be more regular. I mean, we're sometimes discussing regulations or changes, you know, several weeks after they've, they've uh, they come into effect. So today is welcome, but I think it should be a more of an ongoing um, uh, process. Um, just, just to follow up, I mean, I think it is confusing because people are being told you, you can't have three households bubbling but you shouldn't really be doing it, or you may be doing it in certain circumstances. So it's very, very confusing for people. And I think it, it, it points to the, the approach that's been taken, which has been very, very problematic around tackling the virus from the executive's uh, perspective. Um, just wanted to ask, Karen, has there been any discussion um, around the assessment of the surge, the likely, I suppose, maybe more than possible, the likely surge in January, February time? Uh, is there any modeling uh, to predict or suggest what cases may be? Because everybody, in the medical field, seems to be, seems to be warning uh, that come the new year there's going to be a, a spike. So, has there been any assessment of expected cases or figures from the from the executive's point of view? Thank you. Just picking up on your first point, there, the, the executive right from the outset, of the pandemic in March said we needed a, a partnership approach. Um, the executive can do its bit to set law and enabling frameworks. But it's also about individuals, individual responsibility, which comes back to your um, point about communications. People need to know in understandable form what we're asking them to do, what the executive is asking them to do. But this this only works if um, everyone plays their part. So the, the business sector, um, we've had tremendous support from the voluntary and community sector, as this committee knows, and that will continue over Christmas, I have no doubt. Um, the frontline services, but it does come down to individual behaviours as well. So, yes, we have to set a framework, but we do ask that people then follow that. Um, I suppose any administration could have said, uh, this is the law, um, you, you, you must or you, you must not do this, you must not meet up at Christmas. But I, I, they, they took their decision on balance, uh, and we're now hopefully um, asking people just to think very carefully within that and not max out on the three and five unless that, unless that's absolutely vital for their own family circumstances. Um, in, in respect of your second question, the executive, when it meets every Thursday, takes a paper from the Minister for Health um, that gives the latest information on the R value, and then that information is published. So that modelling is an ongoing process, and hopefully there's, there, there's lots of access to, to what that looks like on a weekly basis. Sorry, can I just quickly clarify, uh, Karen? So, I mean, people are, like I said, are concerned about the, the spike that's likely coming in January, February because of uh, the lifting of restrictions. Um, I mean, is there going to be any public releasing of that uh, documentation or concerns? Because I, I think people have a right to know what's coming down the line and if the executive does have a grasp uh, or a handle on it as best as they, as best as they can foresee. Well, I think it's fair to say that um, the, the executive is, is mindful of, of, of the possibility of um, case numbers rising in January. So they take their decisions against that background. I don't think I could go further and give any commitment on anything going into the public domain that doesn't doesn't normally do so, because that would have to be a matter for um, Department for Health. But um, I, I just say again that the, the R value paper is considered every week and then publish, so that does give people a sense of what's happening. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, go on then to Chiara. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Karen, for your briefing today. Um, it's been very helpful. Uh, my question is kind of coming in on the back of Pam's comments earlier, just around the COVID fatigue, which is quite evident. There's been, um, you know, perhaps people are less self-aware, uh, alert, and they're, you know, not really self-policing in the way that they should be. Uh, I'm just curious around what steps the executive has taken to make sure the message around, um, you know, 
self-policing is very strong uh, over the Christmas period, uh, where people might forget. Um, so I'm just curious, from a, a media campaign perspective, um, will anything be coming out online, uh, on TV and in the media over the Christmas period? Yeah, I think, um, thank you. So it's a really good question. It goes to the heart of why this is so difficult. It's uh, asking people to do things for a second and third time. It, it's, it's increasingly harder to do, particularly at this time of year. Um, but it's important. Um, and so, the, yes, there will be additional media, additional messages going out. Um, the, 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 the big one I'm, I keep coming back to is three and five is not target. Um, it's an enabler. And the individual decisions and individual responsibility in there and the basics of the public health guidance can't stress that enough the, the chair opened with it um wash your hands um, wear a face covering where you can um the social distancing and the ventilation for indoors we can't we can't say that enough okay Gareth. and going back on the phone then to jonathan buckley jonathan go ahead please Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Karen, for your briefing. Um, will the guidance be updated to replace uh, references to 14 days self-isolation to 10 days uh, self-isolation? Yes, that's a really good question. Um, yes, it will. And then in respect to Christmas as well, that's um, limiting your social contacts for at least five days before, but more if you can. That's, that's in the guidance. But your specific question on the uh, 14 to 10, yes, it that. That will be updated. That needs to be changed in regulations as well. Okay, thank you. Okay. And Pat Sheehan then on the phone. Pat, go ahead. <clears throat> Pat, you're on mute. <clears throat> Apologies, Chair. Yeah. Uh, I know this section of the meeting is about regulations but uh, I mean I think we're in a pretty dire situation at, at the minute the infection rate is is uh, here in the north is four times uh, what it is in the south um, I've seen um, a, a reputable public health expert come out last night and call for the resignation of the health minister and I think that can be a bit of a distraction, but I, I think what's important here is that we're we're dealing with this pandemic in very much a piecemeal way. Uh, we're here discussing regulations that might or might not have some impact on the transmission rate, when really what we need is a clear strategy on how to deal with this pandemic. Uh, we haven't followed international best practice. Uh, the contact tracing operation has been credited now on a number of occasions, uh, not least by the Spotlight program uh, a few weeks ago. We don't have any checks on people coming in through our ports and airports. We aren't able to collect data on people coming through Dublin airport, uh, coming uh, from the south into the north. and. Could I just uh, make the point that until we have some sort of strategic vision about how to tackle this pandemic, uh, we're going to be condemned to this same situation again and again. And it's, it's not about uh, this party has a view or that party has a view uh, in the uh, executive. It's the responsibility of the health department and particularly the CMO and the chief scientific advisor to bring forward a proper strategy on how to deal with this pandemic. And thus far, they haven't done it. And we spend our time here uh, dealing with these regulations on a piecemeal basis. Uh, I, I think, honestly, we're wasting our time. Uh, if, uh, if, if, if the CMO and the Chief Scientific Officer can't bring forward a proper strategy based on international best practice, on how we deal with this pandemic, then we're just going to be sitting here in the months ahead, uh, trying to, to do the same that we have been doing from the very start. That's my lot for this morning. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, Alan? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think that the, uh, the department has tried in this documentation in front of us this morning, sort of the leaflet form, uh, they have tried to point out that uh, all of this 
uh, does come with uh, increased risk uh, and that you should take personal responsibility. I, I think really the message is uh, these are not targets uh, to be achieved, uh, but that it all comes uh, with a serious health warning. Uh, and it is, uh, it is down to each indiv individual family to do what they can, not only to protect their own family, but uh, to protect everybody else's family. Um, and just a, a comment on, on what Pat's just said there about uh, he's uh, called on the uh, chief medical officer and the chief scientific officer uh, to bring forward a strategy. Uh, and I'd really I'd put the question to Pat, how does he know they haven't already done so? Uh, and that these decisions are made uh, by a five-party executive. Uh, so I think, uh, really, without anybody having inside knowledge of what actually is happening behind the closed doors of executive meetings, I don't think that we should be handing out accusations uh, and accusing uh, professionals of, of not doing their job. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Okay. Um, okay. If, well, first of all, before I go back to Pat, um, uh, uh, Karen, I, I, I welcome the fact that I know there was a bit of a discussion there around the issue of um, the guidance being put online, and the committee would very much support that that information is made public and is made clear to the public. But we would also welcome that we would receive it. So I'm wondering, do you know why that why that guidance wasn't sent to the committee here? at the same time as it was made available online? Um, I, I don't, Chair, um, and I, I'm sorry if, if that wasn't the case. Um, I, I, I can't speak to that. Apologies. OK. Um, the other thing was, Karen, um, in relation to the number two regulations as amended, so they've been amended over a period of, over a period of time, and uh, would it be possible to send us through the, f the full set of amendment two regulations as amended so we can see them um, in their totality, if you like. Can you get that yes, I'll certainly discuss that with colleagues in the Department of Health and um, just make sure you've got the most up to date. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back briefly to Pat there because I'll go back to Pat Sheehan just in relation to Alan's, uh, Alan's question to Pat. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Chair. And I mean, I'm, I'm not here to cast aspersions on anyone. But the, the, the data speaks for itself and the stats speak for themselves. Uh, the situation here in the north is dire. Uh, if you compare it pro rata with any of the other jurisdictions that have performed badly in tackling this uh, pandemic, we are up there. We are right up there close to the top in terms of, of the number of people that we have lost to this pandemic. Now. Uh, there may well be a strategy there, Alan. I don't know. But what I'm saying here now is that strategy, if it's there, is failing. Uh, it's failing our people here in the north. And it's OK talking about personal responsibility, and, and that is important. But it's also important that we have a clear strategy uh, and we have uh, a way of tackling this pandemic. Because if you even compare... Uh, how we're doing here with the South, we are doing much, much worse, much, much worse. Now, why is that? What is the problem? Uh, someone needs to explain that. And, uh, you know, let's talk about there might or there might not be a strategy there. There's a requirement here for transparency and openness so that everyone is clear about what is being done to tackle this pandemic and to try and save people's lives to protect our hospitals and frontline workers. There are eight hospitals out of 12 that are currently over capacity. That situation is going to get worse over the coming weeks. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And there are going to be more people dying. And we're continuing to do the same Mickey Mouse stuff that we have been doing thus far. There were certainly excuses at the start. We weren't prepared. We didn't have PPE. Uh, this thing hit us like a bolt out of the blue. Uh, but we had plenty of time over the summer to get ready uh, uh, to focus on what needed to be done, and we didn't do it. There's actually a letter in the correspondence today from an individual who had to self-isolate and is very critical 
uh, about the support that uh, that she received, and and that's par for the course. I mean, people who uh, have tested positive or who have been in close contact, it's reckoned only twenty percent of them are self isolating. Okay. You know, so Pat, Pat, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna draw it to a close. I'm gonna draw to me, it to a close, Pat, because we we have. But um, I, I I agree that if there is a plan, and I do think I do think we absolutely. Well, I'll that. come back in a minute. I'll I, and, and and this will be through the chair. But um, I do agree that if there is a, if there is a plan, that should be communicated to this committee and to the public. And I think that a clear sense of, of a strategy. The committee itself has asked that there would be significant upscaling of the fine test, trace, isolate, and support element of that plan. And I, I do think it is relevant in order to provide clarity and certainty and to map a map a direction ahead. I'm going to close it now, Alan, with, yeah, with just, this. Just brief. go back to. I mean, Pat's talking about the strategy. We don't know whether a strategy has been brought to the executive by the chief medical officer or indeed by the, the health minister. We don't know that unless you're privy to what's going on uh, within the assembly uh, or within the executive. I'm not privy to it, so I don't know and I can't, so I can't comment on it. And Pat, you were telling us you, you're, you're through always the chair, Alan, figures. Alan, Sorry. Through the chair. Through the chair. Uh, Pat tells us that uh, a few weeks ago he was telling us how well Wales was doing. He was quoting a spotlight programme. We've only to look at the figures this week uh, in Wales where, where the, the transmission rate has went through the roof. So there's, there's, you just don't know what's down the road. Uh, and uh, the, I mean, Pat, uh, uh, his own party hardly set a very good example of a strategy or what people should do or provide leadership by their actions around the Bobby Story funeral. Okay. Okay, members, moving on. And I, I, do, I, I do want to thank Karen. Any other final questions for Karen before? One more, one more, Jerry, and then we'll let. Just, just a general point if we can get um, a commitment maybe from Karen that she'll raise with her team that we'll get regular um, briefings from the executive office because I think we've been lacking that uh, so far. The fact that you know we're. Uh, almost nine months in the pandemic and this is the first time certainly I've came across Karen so I think if she could take that back uh, that would be useful. Okay. Um and a final quick point from Pam then before we go before we let Karen go go ahead Pam. Yeah, thank you Chair. Um I suppose just a a brief comment. I don't want to get trailed into this once again but um and maybe Karen could advise us a bit further but obviously you know, when when Patchy and his, is pointing the finger, he should remember that there he will have at least three fingers pointing back at him, personally, uh, and his attendance at that Bobby Story funeral. And I don't know if Karen has any data on um, public compliance and how that event has impacted on co on public compliance. But I don't think um, that that funeral and the actions around it and the actions around members of this health committee at that funeral, I don't see that as being any positive um, addition to any strategy going forward. It's a very difficult place to be in this pandemic, very difficult, and it's very difficult for the public to maintain the amount of um, discipline that they have done for the length and, the length and duration that they have done. But I think that um, leaders in government, and that includes us, need to be responsible for their actions as well and i think pat should be cognizant of that but i would like to ask karen if if um, she has any um, departmental statistics around public compliance and about how um uh, if she does have any how how that compliance reacted to the bobby story funeral back in june okay karen the direct question is, do I have any data? And, and the direct answer um, to that question is, no, we don't. OK. OK. Um, and I, I take it, Karen, that's the same for a range of events over, over the summer and a range of events since the summer, that though you don't have figures for any of those events. Is that correct? I, I took the question as being to me, Chair. Do I have data? Um, no, I, no, I don't. OK. Okay, well, listen, before we let you go, Karen, can you commit that then to taking that back in, in terms of that request for regular briefings in relation to these issues? Well, Chair, I think um, my ministers would um, would want me to say if the committee has a request in with us for TEO to brief the 
uh, the health committee, then that will be very that will be, that will be considered. Uh, I, I would always have to defer to my ministers on that, but I have no doubt that they would um, consider very carefully any request to have me back. And you will commit to taking the request back. Yes, Chair. Yeah. Okay, Karen, thank you very much for your attendance today and for your responses and for your commitment to provide the, the committee with certain pieces of information which you didn't have to hand but, but that you've committed that you'll, you'll forward and we appreciate that. Um, thank you very much, Karen, and we can, we can let you go with that. Okay? Thank right. you. Okay, members, we're then moving back to, um, and I may need to take a short break, maybe given that we have, we have moved a little bit forward. So, we, we are moving into our departmental briefing on Brexit. I'm going to take a very short break there to get Cathy uh, Harrison, Emer, and Patricia Quinn Duffy here and, and members online. So it's at 10.57 now. Could we uh, return for uh, 11.05? Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. Okay, um, members and uh, panel, you're very welcome back to, we're back online uh, in, in the, to the public. I refer members now, we're going to item six, departmental briefing on Brexit. And I refer members to papers at tab six of your pack and to one item of correspondence at tab 6.1. Can I advise members that officials from the Department of Health are here today to update the Committee on Developments with regard to Brexit? So I'd like, now like to welcome in person Ms Cathy Harrison, Chief Pharmaceutical Officer, and Ms Patricia Quinn Duffy, who is EU Exit Lead on Reciprocal Healthcare and Workforce Issues. I understand uh, members can't hear uh, that are online, so we'll just take a moment uh, for broadcasting to make sure that people can hear us. Yep, so we're just checking with broadcasting can the members online uh, have been unable to hear, and can we get that uh, resolved? Paula, can you hear us there now? I just want to check with you. Yeah, Paula's hearing us there. Okay. So I'm going to resume then with, uh, in terms of welcoming, we're also joined by some officials by video link, and today we have on video link Ms. Emer Smith, who is Head of Medicines Policy and EU Exit Transition, Ms. Fiona Taylor, EU Exit Lead on Medicines, and Mr. Brent O'Neill, Head of Information Governance. And I would like to go ahead then and invite uh, members, uh, officials to go ahead and, and brief the committee, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, everyone. Um, on the 19th of November, um, we provided an update to the Health Committee, and at that time, we endeavoured to come back today and provide some more information. And a paper was shared in advance of this meeting, which I hope the committee found helpful. And uh, this morning, we're just going to go through um, some of the issues um, in terms of focusing on updates since the last time we met. I also thought it would be useful maybe to start with, I'm going to just 
Um, just remind everybody of what the position we find ourselves in and our current level of readiness um, across some key areas. Chair. Yeah. So the, um, the UK um, left the EU on the 31st of January 2020 and moved into a transition period, which now will end at the end of this month on the 31st of December, and there will not be extended. And just, a, just a second, Cathy. Could I ask members online to all make sure you're on mute? We're, we're picking up a bit of uh, background noise from, from someone online. So just anyone who's online and not speaking, well, for now there's no one speaking, obviously, so just keep yourselves on mute, please. Sorry, Cathy. Uh, the UK Government and the EU Commission, as you know, are st actually still in negotiations, and um, even at this late stage, and there is still a possibility that a, de a deal will not be fully confirmed by the end of transition period. And uh, so that's the, sort of the scenario that we would have referred to commonly as no deal. Um, during the transition period, the UK have continued to follow EU law and regulatory processes, but this will change on the 1st of January, when Northern Ireland Protocol to the Withdrawal Agreement will take effect. Um, in advance of the end of the transition period, the Department is now moving into what we call a response phase, and we're working with all of our stakeholders. And we're continuing to review actively and risk an analysis and, and look at our contingency planning. And our goal is to provide the best possible operational response for patients and the public. Um, the EU exit and the Northern Ireland Protocol do introduce potential risks to um, health care, and that covers a broad range of areas, and I'm going to just go through a few of those now. Um, first of all, on the supply of health care products, and specifically here I'm going to talk about medicines and medical devices. Um, um, in relation to national contingencies that cover the whole of the UK, there's been no significant changes since our previous update to the committee, but I will just run through what's in place, given that now these con national contingencies were all designed for the no-deal scenario, which we now may need uh, at this one time. So, uh, Northern Ireland is part of a UK-wide medical supply contingency programme for EU exit, and that's led by the Department of Health and Social Care, but with full involvement of us over the last few years in Northern Ireland and the other devolved administrations. And the UK-wide contingencies, <clears throat> they are seeking to address what the, the biggest risk that was identified for healthcare supplies, and that was a risk of disruption to supplies that could occur in the short straits in the English Channel. And the, during the last two years, extensive national plans have been established, and that's resulted in a multi-layered approach being in place, um, ready for activation, and that includes a high focus on trader readiness for people moving goods from EU into um, UK, and also um, enhanced levels of stock being held within the UK for medical goods, extra ferry capacity, and also an express ferry service for medicines. I would just like to assure um, the committee that our healthcare products and medicines are, ca are categorised as Category 1 goods and that that could be significant in terms of movement of goods into Northern Ireland in the coming weeks. Um, in, in addition to um, all of the work on the supply chain, um, there are now in place uh, greatly enhanced arrangements for surveillance of the medical supply chain in the UK that we're actually using already, and that includes um, enhanced arrangements relating to the management of shortages. And um, MHRA has provided extensive advice on the UK government website, and also regulatory flexibilities have been agreed that will um, include a two-year standstill period for medicines and a two-and-a-half-year acceptance of CE marks for medical devices in relation to licensing. Relating to the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, the UK is currently aligned with the EU, a key for medicines and medical devices, but as I said at the start, this is going to change now on the 1st of January when the EU, um, when Northern Ireland will remain aligned with the EU key and Great Britain will not, and this really has long-term implications for Northern Ireland in both supply and regulation of medicines and medical devices. And we, were, um, we welcomed an, um, the confirmation on the 10th of December um, that the UK, when the UK government published draft unilateral declarations by the EU and UK in the Withdrawal Agreement Joint Committee on Human and Veterinary Medicines, and also the technical guidance that followed on the 11th of December. And in essence, what that did was that um, confirmed 
and the, that we have a 12-month phase-in period for certain elements of uh, changes that need to be introduced relating to the Northern Ireland Protocol. <clears throat> and they relate to falsified medicines directive and also additional regulatory importation controls um, uh, such as manufacture and import authorization and additional batch testing and qualified person. So those changes will all need to be in place by the 31st of December 2021. So we have a 12 months phase in. So they, this was, um, as I say, very welcomed confirmation of a decision that we had understood was made on the 5th of November and I previously advised the committee of that. It's a critical decision for Northern Ireland at this time. Um, because it will allow more time for the pharmaceutical industry and our wholesaling industry to adapt to the longer term changes um, that we are facing. And it also um, is expected to reduce um, or largely remove a lot of the risk that we could have been facing if, if those uh, changes had had to be implemented from um, the 1st of January next year. There's still, um, I suppose, in terms of um, medical supplies, there, um, I have been working very closely with stakeholders in recent weeks to receive, to understand sort of the issues that are of concern to um, the pharmaceutical industry and our wholesalers, our hauliers, everyone involved in the supply chain. And there is still, uh, I suppose, a bit of nervousness around the fact that they believe they're very well prepared. They've signed up for Trader Support Service, which is the advice being given, but that that is an untested system. Uh, that we're moving into and also that um, we have critical category one goods that cannot be delayed so uh, and and also so the importance of um, seeking assurance that those category one goods are not delayed at ports and it w would not be because of their lack of readiness it could be because of lack of readiness from other parties and other complications so that's a piece of work that we're still working through um, uh, what I'm going to do now, uh, Chair, with your permission, I'm going to hand over to Patricia because she has some um, information and there's a little bit of an update on since the papers were provided because things have moved quite quickly this week in some of her areas of work. Thank you, Patricia. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, there has been quite a lot of movement in, in and around the access to health care issues this week. Um, so I'm going to give you an update on the various areas. Um, obviously, the UK and the EU are still negotiating. So there's no... Um, agreement on an uh, EU-UK longer-term reciprocal health care arrangements. However, um, as you know, the EU withdrawal agreement does lay out um, rights for people who have already used their right of free movement. Um, and a lot of things have been confirmed over the past number of weeks, um, and the UK um, government and Department of Health and Social Care have bottomed out some of the issues and to allow people to maintain those rights and to, to understand what they are. Um, so we have the cohorts of people are basically those that have moved their right of free movement and frontier workers. So um, in Northern Ireland, you, EU, EEA and Swiss nationals that are resident in Northern Ireland before the end of transition period will be in scope of the withdrawal agreement. Um, they will be allowed to continue their access to health care and will also have their rights maintained for the, uh, the reciprocal health care under Regulation 883 of 2004 on the coordination of Social Security. Um, what it means for them is that if they are registered with a GP already, they won't have to do anything further. However, if someone arrives before the end of the 31st of December and has not registered with their GP, they will need to provide evidence that they have been in country before the 31st of December. The EU settlement scheme um, will be the main route that uh, EU, EEA and Swiss nationals will register um, their residency within the UK. It is open until the 30th of June next year. And after that point, uh, one of the items that would be sought would be for registering with a GP would be that you have settled status under the settlement scheme. For Irish nationals who are resident in Northern Ireland at the end of transition that have used their right of free movement, um, they as well, if they're registered with a GP currently, don't need to do anything further. Um, if they register with a GP after the 1st of January and have been in country before the 31st of December living, um, they will need to identify that they have been in country before that 
to ensure their withdrawal agreement rights. They will be able to register with a GP in any case uh, if they're living um, in Northern Ireland, but to ensure their withdrawal agreement rights, they have to have been in country before the 31st of December. Um, they also will not have to register with the EU settlement scheme, though I understand that if Irish citizens have partners that are um, non-EEA or EU nationals, it may be in their interests to make a, a simpler process if they do register with the EU settlement scheme. Um, see. Um, so the, we then have the case of frontier workers who also... Just, just before you go on there, Patricia, um, is, this, is this a reciprocal deal between a between the British government and the Irish government, or is this part of the No, e this is part of the EU withdrawal agreement. Okay. Um, in the EU withdrawal agreement, there's this cohort of people who have rights maintained under the Social Security coordination. Um, so basically, anybody that has used their right of free movement either to the UK or to Europe, under 883, they have those rights maintained until they stop that... Um, that, that sort of being in the other country, um, but they will maintain rights um, under the, the scheme predominantly for life. Um, and under healthcare, what that is, is that you have the right to a European health insurance card, that you have the right to an S2, which is planned care treatment. Um, most citizens that would be e EA nationals in Northern Ireland would use that to, to go home to give birth. And you then also have an S1, which allows you to retire home to your home state or to another European country and have your health care paid for by your competent state, which for EEA citizens in Northern Ireland would be the UK. And can I just clarify before you go back to, to your presentation, is that, are the common travel area rates remain intact? As a... I'll, I'll come on to that slightly okay. later in and, the, in and the one... discussion. One other key thing, then, you've mentioned there were people who are uh, who are resident mm -hmm. prior to the 31st of December. What about people who aren't born? Um, under the withdrawal agreement, if you children born to citizens that are already in state fall under the scope of the withdrawal agreement. The withdrawal agreement applies to um, the citizen who has the is in scope, their family and their survivors. Oh. So there's a there's a there's a quite a significant amount of people that are involved in this. It is very complicated. The withdrawal agreement is um, quite complex, but this is part of the work that we have been doing with the Department of Health and Social Care, and obviously DWP, HMRC, looking at how um, we identify people that are in scope, what people need to do to prove they're in scope. Um, and it also means that family members can join at a later date so long as the relationship was there before the end of December, but children born or adopted children fall under their parents um, okay. afterwards. Okay, so go ahead. Okay, um, frontier workers then falling under the agreement. So this would be for people who are frontier workers prior to the 31st of December. Um, so that would be people that work, uh, live in the Republic of Ireland and work in the North of Ireland. And for those citizens, um, their frontier working is a particular type of cross-border working in that you um, have to return home at least daily or at least once a week um, to be included under the social security regulations. Um, at the end of, uh, to maintain the, the citizens' rights under the withdrawal agreement, um, EEA citizens EU and Swiss citizens that live in the Republic and work in Northern Ireland will have to apply for a frontier workers permit to prove that they have a withdrawal agreement right to continue working. That is now open on gov.uk for those citizens to apply. Um, how, many do you think, how many do you think that currently would be? There are some. There are not huge numbers, but there are some. Um, I do know that in health and social care there are a number. Um, probably, probably maybe 50, 60. There's not huge numbers, um, but I know there are a few. Um, so those people would need to have the, the permit. It is open until the 30th of June next year to apply for that. Irish citizens and 
British or Northern, people of Northern Ireland who live in the Republic and work in Northern Ireland do not need to apply for a permit to continue working in Northern Ireland. But again, to demonstrate their, um, their right to healthcare, they may need to keep some documentation to, set, to prove that they were working in Northern Ireland before the 31st of December. Um, mostly that will maintain around being registered with a GP in Northern Ireland. Um, we have about 2,000 um, frontier workers registered with GPs in Northern Ireland cur currently. Um, and all of those people will not need to do anything to continue their rights um, to access the GP. So the withdrawal agreement people will also have a right to a European health insurance card. So if they then travel within the rest of Europe, they will have an, a UK-issued EHIC card. Um, the system is now open uh, for applications for people under the withdrawal agreement um, that they can apply for a new card to use in January of this year. Um, unfortunately, um, this may not be the case unless the UK come to a full agreement with the EU on future reciprocal healthcare rights for everyone else in Northern Ireland. So the EHIC cards may not be available for them from the 1st of January. However, anyone who is travelling or a student who is studying abroad will fall under the withdrawal agreement and will be able to use their EHIC for the continuation of their, their journey or their um, study until they return home. Also, we have people who have moved from Northern Ireland and the UK to live in the, the EU will be able to maintain their uh, EHIC rights. They may be um, either people who have retired to the EU or people who have moved to the EU. Those that have retired to the EU will have UK EHICs. Those who have moved to live and work in the EU will have their, their own their resident country EHICs and they can use those when they return back to Northern Ireland as well to access needs arising healthcare uh, if necessary. Um, in terms of the the common travel area. Um, the common travel area at the moment, um, we do have, um, the UK and the Irish government have been working very closely on getting an agreement in place. Um, it is at a very, very advanced stage and they are committed, both sides, to ensuring that it is in place before the end of the year. Um, these arrangements will ensure that healthcare when visiting the other country will continue to be able to access necessary healthcare when visiting the other country and benefit that citizens will be able to benefit co from cooperation between the UK and Irish healthcare providers um, regardless of the outcome of the negotiations with the EU. These arrangements build on previous commitments that the UK and the Irish citizens who are living in the other country will be able to continue to access healthcare on the same terms as locals. There will also be a commitment to new frontier workers that they will also be able to continue to have access to healthcare on the same terms as now. Um, and we're expecting that to be in place by the end of the year. Um, there was an announcement this morning um, uh, with a, a in Parliament on a unilateral offer for citizens in the event of a no deal who have long term conditions that need ongoing treatment. Um, this will be a time limited health care scheme that supports UK residents when ongoing routine <coughs> treatment needs um, when they're visiting the EEA or Switzerland from the 1st of January. This type of treatment was previously covered under the EHIC scheme. Um, this scheme will be introduced um, with the intention that individuals with certain requirements to treatment abroad, such as regular oxygen treatment or chemotherapy or dialysis, will be able to get that treatment if they travel abroad. Um, the scheme will support travel from the 1st of January 2021 to the 31st of December 2021. Um, people to applying to the scheme must be ordinarily resident within the UK and entitled to the treatment where they reside. Um, full guidance will be published on this and um, essentially it will allow a person to pay for treatments 
Um, it's estimated that oxygen therapy, for example, can cost €500 Euros for a tank of oxygen. Um, for dialysis can be in the thousands. Um, it's to, and it's to allow those people to continue to be able to go on holidays. Um, obviously, they will be encouraged to achieve, to try and secure travel insurance as well, because this scheme will not cover them for needs arising care for other issues that they may have while they're on holidays. Um, we are also working on the cross-border health care directive, and unfortunately, with the considerable amount of things that have come into play over the last number of weeks, we've had to reprioritise looking at the policy around this to the new year. Um, we are at a very advanced stage in it, and we hope that it won't take um, too much time to have that in place um, uh, in terms of the, the policy advice. We also are working on a statutory rule to um, ensure that access to healthcare is accounted for for all of the different cohorts. Obviously, we're still in very late negotiating stages. We were expecting there to either have been the CTA agreement signed and or a deal with the EU. So it's been delayed in being laid uh, until we get to um, some sort of clarification on those issues. One other final issue that I would like to talk to you about is the, the Healthcare Common Frameworks programme. Um, there are three common frameworks um, that are in place uh, going forward for um, healthcare, public health protection and health security, blood safety and quality, and organs, tissues and cells, apart from embryos and gametes, safety and quality. There was a fourth framework, reciprocal and cross-border healthcare, but it has now been um, set aside as no further action at this point, but it will be reviewed in the spring. Um, we're expecting the frameworks to go to um, the Joint Ministerial Council for EU negotiations on Monday, and the um, summary frameworks are on the way to the committees um, because we're expecting that your scrutiny will be in 2021 of those frameworks. I'm going to hand back to Cathy. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And, and I have to say that um, thank you for, for bringing the information. That, that's very interesting. There, there does appear to be some areas of progress, and I think there probably are areas of concern as well. But I'm sure the committee, when we get more of the detail, a lot of this, this stuff, obviously, the, the devil is in the detail. But um, I welcome the fact you've been able to, to bring that um, sort of fairly a substantial amount of information and we will take further consideration of that so thanks for that thank you yeah. thank you uh, chair um in terms of the wider legislative program just to advise the committee that um they you know we you know we advised the committee previously that there were 11 statutory instruments that would have to be considered six of which have now been laid and four will be laid by the end of the year one has been postponed until january next year um uh, finally, just in conclusion, in terms of the update, um, there we do understand you have direct briefings from Food Standards Agency, so I'm, I don't go into a lot of detail here, but we can relay any issues back, as we have done in the past, Chair, if that's okay. Um, there's no updates on data from the last meeting, and just in terms of con concluding, in terms of residual risks and where our focus is currently, um, we have been um, actively reviewing now for the last couple of months um, our state of readiness within Northern Ireland, exploring residual risks where they were um, in, in a lot of detail, really, and with stakeholders. And uh, you know, by way of example, we've done we've um, you know identified specific issues relating to home care, uh, where we've worked with the National Home Care Association and our trusts for those for to secure. Um, assurances around supplies of those medicines and treatments to our patients and other issues that, that came up as issues like controlled drugs, the movement of those that we now have assurances on that there are no issues with the movement of those. We've been working really uh, very closely with pharmaceutical industry and wholesalers. Uh, I would like to put on record the support that they've given to us in the department, my colleagues, and the amount of work that they have actually put in place and contingencies often without a lot of detail and with a high level of uncertainty so um, my, my deep gratitude to them for the for the all of the work that they've done 
Um, last week, we hosted the department hosted three very successful stakeholder events uh, for our community pharmacies, general practices, optometrists, dentists, care homes, and independent hospitals. And this was just to provide them with advice on the operational readiness guidance, answer any questions they may have, and advise um, them where necessary that they should be registering with the Trader Support Service for where any of them do purchase goods direct themselves from GB. Um, so we're really moving into a sort of an active response period now in the next few weeks where we will be um, addressing issues as they arise. We've got, um, in that regard, I'm working very closely with the arms, all the arms length bodies. We've met regularly with them. Another meeting next week just before Christmas. They have guidance to work on and we're also collecting issues now uh, on a regular basis through our situation reports, uh, CITREPS, and that's been escalated up to um, two dedicated strategic cells that I chair within the department so we can address any issues of concern. My colleagues and the team are also um, available for um, specific queries and we have, a, we have a mailbox dedicated to that which is which is monitored as well. So, uh, I mean, in, in general, Chair, that is the end of my update, and we're very happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you. And just for the purpose of facilitating the question and answer session, could I ask maybe that one member of your team or yourself would take the sort of principal answer to a question, and only if there's additional information, maybe from someone else, that, that we include that. Um, and and as we have you with us today, Cathy, maybe you could identify who's best placed to do that. Um, as as usual, I'd ask members to keep a, you know, a question. Well. The, just keep everything as succinct as possible and, and, and as, as focused on the, on the question as possible. And to advise members on the phone again that when you're not speaking, please stay on mute. And if you do have access to a headphone, uh, that is, is best used. So uh, I'll start off a couple from myself and then I'll go, I'll go across to uh, our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron, on the phone and then other members. But you've talked there about the 12 month uh, derogation period that was agreed. Cathy, is it realistic to expect agreement between the two sides in that 12-month period in time, and are the sticking points t political or technical in nature? The, the issues that we are dealing with are technical in nature now, and um, the um, pharmaceutical industry will have to adapt the, how they um, are supplying medicines into Northern Ireland, essentially. So, those changes do require quite a lot of thought in terms of individual businesses and how best they can maintain supplies. Um, so that work, uh, Chair, we will be. There's, 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 well, there's. It's for each individual business to make up their own mind, I suppose, in what how best they believe. You know, from a profitable point of view, they can maintain access or to to supplies for us in in Northern Ireland. Different companies, I understand, are taking different approaches. Um, there is a role for government in supporting this, and we will be working with the Department of Health and Social Care in England and also MHRA in the new year. Um, and we will be starting that work in January um, to ensure that we use the time wisely, because 12 months is not very long for some of the changes that may be needed here. And when you say different governments are taking different approaches, do you mean European? What, what do you no, mean? Different companies. Companies. So. Uh, so, um, so Chair, for example, some companies may choose to um, um, deliver medicines and medical goods directly into Northern Ireland from an EU country, so they may fly them directly in. Um, they may choose to move them up through the Republic of Ireland, or they may choose to use a common transit convention, which essentially moves them through GB, in, in, during which time they have 90 days to move through, but they do not mix with the wider um, with the rest of the GB supply chain, so there are there like are significant bonded, changes. A bonded warehouse type. A bonded warehouse, so. exactly. Yes. Yeah. So there's there's a number of options where the government are not there's not one single option, but they're um, they're they're different companies are making their own decisions. And is 12 months sufficient time to to get there to the solution? Do you think? For most companies, I believe the indications I'm getting are yes, but they're all telling me it's not a very long time. That they are, you know, they're all working now on this. Uh, I, I have to be honest. You know, some have said it may take them longer. It may take them longer, but I think the clarity that has been given in the last uh, in the last week it, it was so necessary because those businesses are experts in logistics, so they know they can now work at at pace. 
you know, and, and of course the government will be working closely with them where needed. And I know, and we have been discussing this, I think, uh, for, for some time, even prior to the, to the restart of the Assembly. But, um, and, and when we were discussing it in, in August, September, October 19, it was the short straits issue in that. This issue say, seemed to kind of almost materialise towards the end as, as a significant issue. Are there potential other issues on the horizon that haven't been considered or that you're now starting to become aware of as a result of, of the everything coming now so, so close to a conclusion? Well, the issues that have arisen that uh, in relation to these additional um, checks that are needed and the FMD compliance are a consequence of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which of course wasn't with us in when we met Chair in, in August nineteen. Yeah. So it's a consequence of of okay. the of of the sort of the, the agreement on the thirty first of January and and Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, so, um, sorry, the, your second point. Are there other? Are there other? Uh, well, well, actually, I'll, I'll move. I'll move on. That, that does address that for me. Okay. I, w I wanted to move on then to the issue of stockpiling. Um, so, the contingency programme in relation to stockpiling medicines and medical devices has that been successful, and to what extent? And how much time do we have stockpiles for now? And is that enough for a worst case scenario? Okay. So, the 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 ask from government was that. Um, um, a minimum of six weeks additional stock was held within the supply chain for medicines within the UK. That's on top of business as usual stocks, um, there is a, there are, and there uh, and assurances have been provided on that basis. Um, in Northern Ireland, we also know that we're holding a lot more stock here in Northern Ireland. There's not a, you know, in, uh, um, more than that. So some of our wholesalers, for example, are are telling me they've have um, in excess of um, three months stock in place where they would normally have perhaps seven or eight weeks. So there's significant uplift in stock of it, um, both in GB and also importantly in Northern Ireland. Our hospitals are holding more stock. And um, the, you will know, and I've advised you before, that the emphasis in the terms of our contingencies has always been within the supply chain. And this has been to prevent and avoid the need for Pharma, community pharmacies and uh, to, to stockpile and frontline services, so that we do have assurances that we've got more stock in the system, Chair. Okay, and a final quick one then, just for you, and then have one for Paula. Uh, contracts with ferry operators are in place to transport Category One goods, and you, you'd reference that the medicines are within that Category One, and that those are in place. Those contracts are in place for six months. What's anticipated to happen after that period of six months? I think that the contract these are the contracts that are in place between EU and GB. Okay, so they and they're managed by DHSC. So six months I, I understand is an is is the agreement. Um, because that is the the assessment of risk was that disruption would occur over a period of time and by six months a new way of working would have been established here. Um, I mean I would I don't have any more detail than that other than I common sense would suggest they may if they need to be extended they would be you know beyond that period but that was based on evidence and on an analysis of the risk the six months period okay thank you and uh, Patricia just in relation to you'd mentioned during your presentation that the access to the EU settlement scheme would end on the 30th of June mm -hmm. Does that mean from that period forward you enter into this uh, new uh, points immigration points based immigration system? And what impact is that likely to have given we know the situation we're in in relation to healthcare staff, healthcare vacancies? We're seeing that playing out right now in front of our eyes in relation to COVID 19, but we know it's a, more, a problem more generally. And we are very conscious, I think, that at, at a given at a period in time we were looking at um, potential. Uh, income limits for where people had to be at, I think it was 30,000, which wasn't appropriate to hear. So what's your assessment of what impact that is likely to have on our provision of healthcare staff to a degree that we need? The immigration system will, will be in place from the 1st of January. Um, so any new EU citizens that want to live and work in the UK will need to have a skilled worker visa at that point. Now, the system itself has been extended um, to include, at the moment it is from uh, the qualification level of degree and above, um, it will expand down to A level and above, so it will allow some 
further um, qualifications and roles to be included in the skilled worker route. What it won't include will be around um, social care staff in particular. So there is a, an issue um, around the continuation of uh, non-national social care staff. Um, one of the issues that will um, is when we come into the new year, uh, the system itself will fall under where we are now, which will include the NHS visa, um, or the health and care visa, uh, as it's called. And what it does is it um, fast tracks the application process for people using um, a skilled worker route visa. It also um, removes the need for them to pay for the immigration health surcharge, with the, which at the moment is £625 per person per year. So the UK government have realised that um, workers in the health and care sector need to have some incentives to, to come and work. Um, the shortage occupation list um, does include all nursing categories and all doctor categories. There were some recommendations made by the Migration Advisory Committee in their last review, um, but the government has decided not to implement those uh, at the moment until they review the uh, worker profile and the uh, impact of the immigration, new immigration system um, come January. Um, but what it means is that any workers that are within the shortage occupationists currently we do have a different um, salary threshold. It has been removed, moved down to £26,400. Uh, £26, and for those on the shortage occupation list or for uh, trainee roles, it has been reduced down to £20,400. Um, so it, is, it does give us a bigger scope for roles to be included in the skilled worker route. But it wouldn't still take in domiciliary care workers? No, it won't. And is that not a concern? It is a concern, yes. Um, the, the government, um, the, we have um, engaged quite significantly around this issue, and it's not just a problem for Northern Ireland, it's a problem right across the UK in terms of domiciliary and social care staff. Um, and I think the government's position, to be honest, is that um, because of the, the uplift in unemployment, that um, they're expecting the home market to be available for staff at the moment, um, but it is but something that we. It's, it is. It's a bit speculative. It's not. Yes. It's not. It's not very planned, or you know. It's, it's, I'm a bit concerned given the pressure, and we are, as a committee, we are hearing of, of already the lack of availability of domiciliary care packages. This, the pressure that's putting on the care home sector, the pressure that's putting on hospital discharges. Mm -hmm. so it's a very complex system and a very, very worrying yeah. element of that. Very important it is. and very worrying element. So, are there, are there any other plans to, or how do you impact? How does the Department of Health here? How does the Department of Health here say to the, the British government, here's what we need, here's what our population, here's what our system needs to be part of this? How does that? That has been included in, in correspondence and uh, between the, the, the minister and the government here, and it's part of the programme because not only is health and social care, but also agricultural workers as well. So it has been, it is something that the, everyone is very aware of. Um, the Department for the Economy is in the lead on the immigration piece, and we've been working very closely with them, and social care work has always been on the agenda as a problem. Um, it has been very clearly identified at every point that it is not satisfactory. Okay. okay. Um, I'll, I'll, go on to, I'll go on then to, to members. So I'll go first of all to our Deputy Chair there, Pam Cameron. Pam, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank the panel for their attendance at the committee today. It's obviously a very complex subject um, in its entirety, but I have a couple of um, different questions for you here. I wanted to ask you, first of all, if, if you as officials agree with the Minister's assessment that the UK internal market bill will protect NI from the potential divergence on bloods, organs and tissue affecting the supply of these products to NI and, and does the EU law not trump everything else? That's the, my first question. And then the second one is um, around, uh, I wanted to ask you why uh, there's a particular concern in respect of continuity of, of supply of category one critical goods 
through GB ports to NI? And why isn't this covered by the 12 month derogation agreed by the EU and UK? And how many of the weekly HGV consignments secured by the uh, Her Majesty government will benefit Northern Ireland? I'll take the, the, um, your question on the um, divergence around blood tissue and organs. Um, the, the common frameworks that are being um, organised are really the framework that uh, officials and uh, administrators will use around the divergence, because obviously uh, blood tissue organs safety and quality is a devolved matter. So each of the nations can technically diverge um, if they wish to do so or, or saw a need to do so. Obviously, in Northern Ireland, we have to comply with the EU regulations under the NI protocol, um, which means that we have to keep pace with that. And there is potential for divergence for us to have to comply with a new EU regulation or indeed for GB uh, nations to decide they wish to have a divergence. The framework sets out the process by which each of the nations would work together to ensure that if there was a divergence that it wouldn't impact on the internal market and to ensure that all of the devolved nations were aware of any um, processes that would come into place within a certain area to deal with a certain issue. Um, as, for example, the organs are dealt with on a national basis, um, it, is, it is a very close um, working relationship that we have um, in terms of organs and tissue, and again, blood as well. Um, Northern Ireland in itself is predominantly self-sufficient in blood and does um, bring in some blood from the rest of GB, and it's to ensure that that supply can continue. Um, and the framework basically is the how we will try and manage that divergence to minimise the impact. I hope that answers your question. Okay, Pam. Yeah. So do, do you... Yeah, go ahead again, Pam, for you another a follow-up or another question on that? I had the other question already on the critical goods. I think that okay. yeah. you want to come back on. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the, if the question is around what is the concern around the ports, well, um, the, the issue here really is around trader readiness. And um, I think in my update, I did um, indicate that we, you know, we have high levels of assurance around read, readiness in relation to the pharmaceutical supply chain. And, uh, and also that our goods are category one. So the anticipation is that there, that, uh, there, there won't be any delays at ports in terms of the flow of those goods from GB into Northern Ireland and back again, of course, because uh, those lorries have to return um, back um, empty. And uh, the, the, I suppose the, 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 so the residual concern we've got, or the current concern, is that it's, it's everyone else who will be at the ports, whether they will have the same level of readiness. And just um, it's the, the importance for all businesses who trade between um, Northern Ireland and Great Britain that, um, to sign up immediately with the trader support service and make sure they are prepared and that will avoid some of the um, potential risks that could occur um, if people turn up and they're not prepared and haven't got to the customs declarations completed for example um, and we, you know we, we, are, we are seeking assurances that flow will be will be prioritized uh, and that'll be important. So I suppose they're, they're the main issues around around ports. We have got assurances that there we, there's no concerns around ferries and ferry capacity, for example. So it's mainly just the logistics um, at the port and the handling of the new trader readiness arrangements on that on that matter. Uh, and the third question was in I think was in in relation to the 400 million. Is that correct? And Northern Ireland share of it. Or are the share of it for health? Uh, the the weekly HGV consignments secured by Her Majesty's government. Oh, the, how that would benefit TNI? I think that's what it was. Oh, those consignments that are coming into um, the those consignments that are guaranteed coming in from EU um, are. I mean, at, at at this moment in time, they will benefit Northern Ireland because we're, our, our goods will still flow through the UK system for the next 12 months. 
um, uh, Vice Chair. So yes, so I mean our, our needs would be included in those at the moment. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I, 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 I am aware that Brandon needs to leave us around 12, so I just want to check, and, and Brandon would have some of the information around data, maybe, so I just want to check if there are any members who have a specific issue around data that want to ask Brandon a question, and I'll, I'll rejig things a wee bit to take account of that. Jonathan, potentially, and I know Arlea, Arlea then has one, so I'll, I'll go to Arlea first, who was on my list anyway, and then I'll check with Jonathan. Uh, sorry, I'll just check with Jonathan. No, sorry, I'll go to Arlea and then back to Jonathan. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, it was just the, the question that I had asked um, the last time we, we had um, this presentation in front of the committee. It was around the, Kathy had mentioned in the brief, around some of the data sharing issues. And it was just to see if um, you could elaborate a wee bit more on so what the, the actual problem is with the data sharing um, and, and who it's between, because we know there's been issues even on an all island basis, north and south in the context of um, COVID and with the, the data sharing um, issues that users are having at present, I know that they obviously haven't been resolved. Um, can the delay in resolving these issues, can this be putting any um, patients at risk in relation to medicines and medical devices? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, um In relation to patient data exchange, there is no issue or no holdups. You may be talking about the passenger locator forms and that the minister gave an update on Monday during an update to the assembly on North-South matters, uh, sorry, North-South Ministerial Council in response to Mr. O'Dowd, but it's outside of this, um, of matters related to EU exit. So, sorry, Brayton, so the, the, the data issues, um, the, the, the data sharing issues that you are talking about, um, I'm still not clear then. So what, what is those issues? What is the, the problem? There's no problem for the exchange for patients receiving treatment, um, either north, south or south north. Those have all been underpinned with contractual agreements and there are firm contracts, uh, firm contracts in place to cover all that. So there should be no issue. So, so sorry, the, so the, the outstanding issue is the lack of the adequacy agreement okay. um, with the EU. Um, right. friend, and do you want to say something about that? S certainly, sorry. The, yes, the adequacy, at the minute, there's still a conversation going on about achieving data adequacy. That just simplifies the exchange of patient information. However, the arrangements that are currently in place will ensure that data flows regardless. Okay, Brent, thank you. That's that's clear. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, moving on then to Paula. Paula Bradshaw, please. You're on mute, Paula, I think. Sorry. Yeah. Um, thank you, Cathy and Patricia. Uh, I've, I've got two questions, but before I get to those, I just want to place on record my thanks to you both. I've always found your briefings excellent, not just the Health Committee, but prior to um, to, to the Assembly um, being restored, and I know we've had a, a lot of work over the last few years. Um, Patricia, my first question is to you, in relation to some of the changes you've mentioned there that will come in around medical health care for Irish nationals, for example. Um, what consideration has been given to the fact that um, a lot of the GB practices are really under a lot of pressure? They're going into the Christmas season now with some closures and stuff. How are some people who receive this information at this late stage, and it's not your fault, I appreciate that, how do they get registered in such quick time to avoid any then complications at the far side? And how are you going to communicate with people to try and speak, get, encourage them to actually re register with the GP? First question, thank you. The registration with the GPs has been streamlined uh, in the past year uh, in any respect. Um, uh, to register with a GP, um, the GP only needs to check that the person is legally in the UK. The rest of the assessment um, is done at the business services um, organisation. Um, 
So basically, there is a streamlined process already in place. A person will be registered with a GP for three months, and during that time, there will be an assessment check to ensure that they are in the country. Um, as they say they are, that there's evidence of them living and working, and they may be asked to provide some documentation to prove that. But that will be done via BSO, and the person will be registered when the form is completed and has been sent to BSO. Um, so there shouldn't be any delays uh, for any reason at, at that point. Um, the, how we're c communicating this to patients is that we are um, updating NI Direct to ensure that the information is, is clear there to advise those um, with their citizens' rights what they need to do. And we've also had some communications with other organisations uh, uh, to advise and some of the organisations that work with EEA nationals um, to ensure that they're aware of the, uh, um, the arrangements as well. We also have a, an update tomorrow which um, we will, some, with some other stakeholder groups, which will be able to update as well, some advice groups, uh, to ensure that they're aware of those issues and where to get the information from. Yeah, no, no, I really appreciate that. I'm just conscious that as a health committee, we know how difficult it is to get through the GP practice at the minute because of the pressure of COVID and you can't just call in and stuff. So I don't know that's outside your control, but I appreciate the information around how you're trying to communicate. My second question um, goes back to Cathy, um, and it was uh, following on from what you said to Colm around stockpiling. You'll recall earlier this year, um, there was a problem when the pandemic first hit, then a uh, shortage of the sub subutamol nebulizers. And so a lot of what, um, I suppose a lot of the planning is probably looking at our normal times. How are you factoring in then another pandemic or another big issue that will just come out of left field and will actually just throw um, a spanner in the works in terms of a lot of your preparations? Thank you. So the, the issue that occurred in terms of the salbutamol, um, and it, in, it, was, it, it arose because of a general um, upsurge in demand for prescriptions for, for people maybe you know who had had an inhaler at some point in time and concerns around um, respiratory health. That was short term and that, um, that did cause some short term issues. It wasn't really a shortage issue, it was just a peak in demand um, and, and it was short term and now resolved. The contingencies that are in place cover every single part of the medicine supply chain. We've looked at everything uh, and all products and there's a high level of um, you know, intelligence around what's going on in the supply chain right now, uh, and uh, so uh, which allows which allows us to monitor at a national level and also then in Northern Ireland take action if needed on specific issues that we know may be coming up. Um, the amount of sort of stock in the UK at the moment means you know we do, we're actually dealing with a very very small number of issues really at this moment in time um, and. Uh, you know, and should they arise, we have arrangements in place to de to deal with to deal with those. Um, um, so, COVID has been factored in in terms of business as you know the business as usual um, stock levels have adjusted over the last few months. You know, and so for certain product lines, and ev and all of the stockpiling and contingencies are on top of those. So, I th at this moment in time, you know, we have fairly robust arrangements in place around our, our, around our medicine supplies. Okay. You're on mute, Paula. Paula, you're, you're on mute there, Paula. You're on mute. I'm sorry, we didn't get that last sorry. question. No, I've just, just gone back to say, I think part of the issue with the inhalers and possibly other um, medicines going forward is that as soon as people within a sort of health community think there's a shortage, then people then sort of rush to the GP to try and, and, and get their stock up, up to date. So I think that's part of, was part of the issue. It wasn't, as you say, necessarily the um, the big stockpile, but it was, it was really just trying to get through the supply chain to the GPs and the community pharmacists. But thank you very much again. I just like to say there is no need for any anyone at all to order additional prescriptions at the moment you know our advice is uh, people should just continue to do what they always do order the repeat prescriptions and our doctors have been advised not to not to authorize longer prescriptions or anything because of all the work that has gone on within the supply chain uh, and just trying to keep 
things um, as normal as possible and there's no current shortage in relation to inhalers as well just because I know people are very worried about a lot of things at the moment and um, you know and, and just to give that assurance thank, thank you. you thank you Paula going then to Jonathan on the phone uh, on the video conference and Jonathan Buckley please go ahead thank you chair can you hear me yes yeah we're hearing you um, Thanks to the panel there for their for their contributions. Uh, it's it's always is helpful to hear from from both of you. Uh, I suppose I've consistently raised my issues surrounding the impact of the the protocol arrangements, not only on on other sectors, but indeed principally with in relation to this committee, the supply of, of medicines and devices. Uh, the twelve month derogation from the effects of the protocol is without doubt welcome, and indeed I know industry welcome that in terms of preparedness. But unless officials and indeed governments uh, put in the hard yards now it is simply just a case of kicking the can down the road uh, local businesses and patients i believe deserve better than than this sort of limbo and state of, state of a, a execution and it states, states in your briefing to comply with the protocol companies supplying medicine, medicines through gb to ni would need further batch testing and qualified person certif uh, certification in the eu northern ireland uh, which would be costly and damaging to the free transit of medicines to northern ireland so let's be clear these costly uh, requirements have not gone away they're simply delayed and we do need a, a vibrant set of mutual recognition recognitions uh, agreements in the areas between the UK and the, the EU going forward. So with that in mind, uh, and it's probably to Cathy, do, do the officials acknowledge that the 12-month derogation from the protocol does not remove the inevitable uh, delay and cost envisaged by new ba batch testing and qualified person controls from this time next year? And would a comprehensive mutual recognition agreement remove these challenges? Uh, the... 12 months does not remove the need for compliance all it gives is, is more time and it gives critically it gives industry more time to think through how they will deal with these logistical challenges and that's how from my engagement with them that's how they are approaching this they're looking at it as logist logistics and they're looking at ways that they can um, manage the changes and comply with comply with um, legally with with the with the requirements of the protocol, but also um, without prohibitive cost increases. And I think that's why the time is so critical. I don't believe it'll be wasted. Um, industry are, you know, I know they're already making decisions. Some are come stepping forward to tell me what those are in, in specific product lines, very reassuring. Um, others have more complex um, business portfolios where they're dealing with a lot of different manufacturers. And it they'll probably, they will need to work through the next 12 months. Um, costs are an issue we need to just we just I mean, we are we, this certainly will not be the last briefing that we will be given the committee in terms of this these subjects and and uh, cost is something that we will be paying particular attention to in the new year um, the again through my engagement with industry I, I can tell you that because of the volume of stock that's in the UK at the moment and the amount of and our assurances around flow at the moment that through the 12 months phase-in period, you know, the impact of cost may not be immediate, but that is something that we will have to be to bear in mind, and also bear in mind whether those costs should all be borne by Northern Ireland, because after all, this is a UK uh, decision to leave the EU, uh, you know, in terms of the implications on our on our costs for our small population, but that's perhaps um, um, on, on the issue of mutual recognition, that's something that the EU have not reached a decision on. Uh, and I understand mm -hmm. it is still it is still an issue that industry are, are very keen on, on supporting. Okay, and, and just uh, what I did say, in your opinion, would a comprehensive mutual recognition agreement remove the current challenges? Obviously, it'll depend on what the agreement, the scope of the agreement. Um, but it may there's a, there, it may not it may not remove the risks relating to. Uh, that are outlined that are specific to our compliance with the Northern Ireland Protocol. So I think there is a little, okay. there, there's, a, there's more, we need to explore in more detail, you know, the words in the agreement, should it be presented uh, or should it be agreed and understand then what the implications are. I couldn't give any assurance at this moment in time. My understanding is that it may not. 
Okay. Okay. And, and, and secondly, can you give more detail on which home care, I heard you mention home care products, have been identified as potentially uh, seeing supply shortages uh, and how have these barriers uh, come about? They, okay, they, they, uh, first of all, the home care sector, um, this is where um, we have treatments for patients are delivered directly to the patient and maybe where a nurse might be involved in the administration of a, of a medicine or a treatment, generally specialist treatments for patients at home. And uh, there's a number, uh, a number of different companies that are involved, and, and the majority of them move their, move their uh, treatments directly in from GB. So we've been working with them in the last few, few weeks in particular, and, uh, and also working with our trusts. And, and what, what I needed to know was that they, um, they understood the requirement to register with Trader Support Service, for example, to sign up to make sure that their goods would not suffer from any delay and have those assurances. I also asked our trusts to look in detail at what support they may need to give to the home care organisations and to make sure that there was a good lines of communication in place, which have had that assurance, and also that we have contingencies in Northern Ireland in if anything unforeseen should happen and the assurance I've had on that is that there are already tried and tested systems in place in Northern Ireland for home care patients should there be a disruption in their supplies so um, so for that that was a very worthwhile one of our residual risks one a very worthwhile deep dive that we have done my team and I into the home, home care um, with the, both the providers and the health service okay, okay. thank you Jerry Thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, two questions, Patricia. Uh, I know you said the cross-border health care directive is kind of, I think, work is to be finalised in the year, sort of slightly paraphrasing you there, maybe. Um, uh, just in terms of my understanding, uh, I think in the pact it says they'll be protected for up to a year uh, as it stands. Um, so the concern is that people who may be waiting, you know, for two or three years or longer for treatment. Uh, and so how does this work? So the, the current arrangement ends in a year. Um, and then is a new scheme developed by both departments uh, to ensure people get treatment or what's the kind of... The, the treatment itself, um, the cross-border health care directive um, allows patients to go and get um, treatment in a private or public sector. Most people go to the private sector in another country to have uh, treatment done um, and then reclaim the funds up to the cost of the local tariff rate for that treatment. Um, the way this is, the system is that because the directive itself will no longer apply to the UK, there isn't the support around um, patient advice in the other countries, and there isn't the same reciprocity around the, the directive once we get to the end of the year. Um, so anyone who has applied, has had treatment, or um, is seeking treatment, um, by the end of the, this year, will be able to complete that process. So anyone who has already got authorisation, has applied for authorisation or started treatment, will be able to finish that off, have their treatment and get their, their um, reimbursement. Um, from the 1st of January, um, the directive will no longer apply and patients will not be able to access that kind of treatment and that access. What we will be looking at is the policy position, the policy principles around the cross-border healthcare directive because we can no longer participate in it to see if in Northern Ireland it is appropriate to offer a similar or some policy around uh, that for patients going forward. Yeah, okay. I mean, that would be certainly... I don't claim to be an expert on that. You obviously are, but my sort of understanding of it as I, as I see it you know, there's MOUs around different uh, issues, obviously, but if there could be a, a policy or a scheme, you know, developed between the two departments to ensure people get that treatment over the next couple of years, that would be certainly something that I think and most people w w would support. Um, okay, so January is when that's going to be yeah, we will hopefully finalised yeah, yeah. and we'll get a briefing on that, hopefully. Okay, thanks. Um, um, Cathy, just for yourself, uh, in terms of stockpiling, I mean, I know you can't give us a detailed list, but do we have a a general sense of what's stockpiled here and what's stockpiled um, in Britain? The, um, I should have mentioned actually uh, that we have, um, our BSO have 10 weeks stockpile of 
over 1,700 commonly used lines that they're responsible for as well, and um, also have access to further stocks available in uh, the UK. As a minimum, I can say that we have there would be six weeks available stock of, of, of all medicines. Um, Here. And in Northern Ireland, um, there, we, we didn't ask for additional on top of that, but the assurances that I'm getting are that there are significantly more stock levels in, in place. You know, things three three months plus is the is the is the figure that I that I am hearing within our supply chain. That's a, which is a lot more than which is a lot more than we would normally have for a just in time. And in addition to stockpiling, can I just say that one of the other big changes that we're seeing is that our wholesalers, some, a number of our wholesalers are also changing their models of their business models and where they would have been traditionally short line wholesalers that would have held um, just fast moving lines in Northern Ireland and then drawn in slower moving lines from um, bases in GB that actually they have advised me that, they're, uh, that they are moving to more what they call mainline, which means they're holding um, a full inventory of stock in Northern Ireland. So it's it's volume and it's also range of stock that we have much more of currently in, in Northern Ireland. All right, just to clarify, Cathy, do we have all, all medicines for six weeks stocked here? And there's stockpiles. I, I, what I should say, and the other thing is, stockpiles, I think people can think of as a big warehouse full of medicines. Mm. The, this stock is in the supply chain, so it's access to six weeks stockpile, six, six weeks. But I can tell you that we also have physical increased the stock that is being held within our um, wholesaler supply chain in Northern Ireland and both both for our commonly used lines and some of our pharmaceutical companies as well are holding much more stock in Northern Ireland Sorry, and in addition to that we've got an assurance that there's overall for all medicines at least six weeks within the supply chain across the UK which we also have access to. Right, sorry, Chair. Maybe it's me not getting that, but do we we do have six weeks stock piled in the north. We have it. We have. A, we will have. Let's see. I mean, I think we have at least six weeks is what what I would say. But it isn't necessarily a stockpile. It's within the supply chain. We would have uh, that 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 sto those stocks um, access access to them. So I think the answer is yes. We have access to. We have we have significantly increased volumes of stock within Northern Ireland. It's different for different product lines. Some have a lot more than six weeks, and um, some of the businesses are telling me they've got in excess of three months. Yeah, but but it's not but it's not all within the north. I suppose I suppose the, the concern would be given. Um, say for example on PPE, it took I think six weeks from our first case that we got. A drawdown out of that out of that stockpile. As chief pharmaceutical officer, would you not prefer that we had a physical stockpile rather than? I get I get what you're saying about the supply chain, but as chief pharmaceutical officer for the north, are you satisfied? And and I'm also conscious of issues with ferries. You know, and, uh, you know, including COVID issues with with ferries and other issues that someone mentioned earlier. Other contingencies kick in. You get maybe a couple of factors coming together at the same time. Would you not be as uh, uh, is that not a concern? Well, a decision was made very early on in terms of national contingencies and also for here that stockpiles are problematic because you end up having warehouses full of stock that need managed, whereas the preferable way to manage risk within the supply chain was to have more stock in the supply chain that would flow into Northern Ireland. We have, as a consequence of our arrangements, we have much more stock in Northern Ireland than we ever would have. And, and I mean, I do have to assure the committee that we do have a high volume and range of stock, much higher than normal within Northern Ireland. In addition to that, there is the ask of government overall has been a minimum of six weeks on top of business as usual within supply chains. That is the minimum that I'm hearing. And there's much more. And not only of that, there's much more in Northern Ireland. And um, so stockpiles, there's, you know, over, you know, there's thousands of lines, you know, on medicines decision was made, I suppose from our experience of stockpiles, that it's it's imperfect, holding stock government stockpiles. And the more sustainable situation here and considering that we could have disruption over a number of weeks is for the the stock to be held within the supply chain. Yeah. I suppose and, and I take that point that there are lots of stock of lots of things, but I suppose if the if the item you need 
is not in, st in stock or runs low, then you're 100 percent out, if you like, regardless of the overall. So I suppose it's the complexity of the. But a quick point from Arlea in that. Yes, just on that, um, thank you. Um, so I'm just wondering, Kathy, and it is good to know that the we we'll have the stocks, you know, prepared and whatever for for that period of three months. But ha have you looked at any contingency plans? Um, on an all island basis with the south, so say that you do end up in a doomsday scenario where there is blockages at the ports um, uh, within the north or with the, the blockage at the, the English Channel. Have you had any conversations to put in contingency plans? I'm just thinking of the likes of you had mentioned earlier that the category one products are literally ones that you just cannot afford to have shortages with, you know, because they're obviously so vital to helping people. So have, have there been any conversations with the, the we South have, on We've got help? ongoing dialogue with the with the South when I have an official there that I'm in regular contact and I've actually got a request for a call from him I think this afternoon or tomorrow before the before the, the Christmas holiday. So we're in we're in regular communication with that and you know if if it was required, you know, we would we would be able to draw on our good relationships and um, I mean, there are complexities, you know, around because there, there's differences in licensing, for example. So it's not just as simple as um, as it could be. But in in an emergency, we would certainly, and we would, we would have an agreement that we would call on one another if we need to. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, just, uh, I don't see any uh, problem uh, around the supply of the COVID vaccine. Uh, given that it is coming in uh, through central government. But uh, can you just reassure us today that uh, Brexit will not um, create or present any obstacles to the free flow uh, of the vaccine coming through to Northern Ireland? And when we talk about uh, the drugs being, you know, the stockpile and the, the six-week supply and stuff, I assume that we're talking about uh, purely prescription drugs, or maybe not. Uh, because um, I'm thinking about the, I mean, a lot of us self-medicate when you've got a, a, a cold or whatever, uh, and it's just off-the-shelf products you buy out of the pharmacy. Um, and I, I'm very conscious uh, that paracetamol just disappeared off the shelves in the early days of the pandemic, and uh, children's paracetamol uh, medicines, which was quite concerning because, you know, things like Calpol, uh, would be a, a standard uh, product in, in any parent's uh, medical chest, uh, and they just disappeared off the shelf for, for, for some considerable weeks. So uh, can you assure me once around the vaccine, but also that there will be no problems with uh, non-prescription drugs that we, we use to self-medicate? Uh, first on the vaccine, there are no issues with the flow and deliveries of the vaccine into Northern Ireland. Um, secondly, in terms of the scope of the arrangements around stockpiling, they include um, um, prescription-only medicines, but also pharmacy medicines, which can only be sold by under the supervision of a pharmacist. So your stronger painkillers and some cough medicines and other treatments, and also general sales list medicines, which are the ones that you can buy in pharmacies, but also supermarkets and other shops. Yeah. So it covers everything. It covers everything. Thank you. Chiara. Thank you, uh, Chair. I uh, thank you, Cathy uh, and Patricia, for being here today. Um, your contributions have been extremely helpful. Uh, my question kind of comes off the back uh, of Orlea's comment there, just around um, the Western Trust, uh, and it's around medicine on a cross-border basis. So just on the topic of the Northwest Cancer Centre based in Alton and Galvin, um, I believe they get um, their isotopes, the radioactive isotopes, from the south. And I'm just wondering, uh, do you have any concerns surrounding um, any difficulties on this as a result of Brexit? Okay, so medical radioisotopes are one of the areas that we looked at, and, and I think, Chair, you will remember it was a subject we have talked about at length throughout the, the last couple of years. It was one of the first areas, actually, that we um, pinpointed as needing a high level of assurance on. I can give that. Um, these are products that have a very short life. They are transported into Northern Ireland for, the treat for tre both treatment and diagnostic purposes for patients, and they're used in two sites in the Western Trust and Belfast. They fly actually in to, from the EU into East Midlands Airport, and then they fly directly into Aldergrove from where they move to Western and Belfast Trust. We have 
um, revisited on a number of occasions and very recently are contingency arrangements around that and had assurances that we're not ex anticipating any issues in relation to medical radioisotopes. Um, and just on that, um, have you had regular conversations with the Western Trust? I had a meeting with the senior team, I can't remember because the days go in, I think it was la only last week, it might have been only last week or maybe the week before, um, specifically on the issue of um, EU transition and specific issues in relation to their, their, their particular needs on the with the border services. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, just a quick related one on that, and actually I was, inter I was wondering about the isotopes as well, so I'm glad that has been, been raised. Um, medical devices, I know at the previous, uh, cliff, uh, at, at, at the previous time there was a, a decision taken very quickly to create a facility in Belgium to provide uh, stents. But are there other issues now, or are, are, are the issue of medical devices kind of um, one-off custom-made items, are those a part of the 12-month um, delay, or are those a separate area of concern, or are, they, is, are those concerns addressed at this point? In terms of like one-off medical devices, are you thinking like bespoke? Custom, yeah, thing, custom, custom made. made things that you can't yeah. stockpile. Custom I made. I think I might have to go. I will have to go and find that out for you, Chair. I don't have an answer on that issue. Okay. Um, but I, I come straight back to the committee with that. Okay, I appreciate that. There's another one then I wanted to ask you, sort of taking you up on the offer that you had said around frameworks generally, um, and and I will we we will be doing more on this in, in terms of some of the frameworks later. But just to ask you, when 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 you have you, um, the scope, it's, it, the legislation states that the legislation within the scope of the framework is detailed within Annex Two, and therefore European legislation will continue to be applicable. And so, I'm wondering what what is the point of us being in a framework with Scotland, England, and Wales, in an area where we're bound to the EU, first of all, and second of all, then sort of building on that. There is mention that officials from Scotland, England and Wales will cooperate on mechanisms should be built where possible. Would it not make sense that, that officials from the Dublin government would also be, or Dublin departments would also be involved, given our frameworks are going to need to include north-south as well as east-west? The frameworks themselves um, are designed by the UK government on areas within the, more or less, the internal market within the UK. Right. Um, to for issues where there was an EU competence which has returned back to a devolved um, area, to a devolved competence, which means that there is an ability to diverge. And yes, the um, Northern Ireland Protocol um, makes, particularly in the blood and tissues area, that we have to comply with EU regulations. Um, but what it means is that it keeps the rest of GB and the whole of the UK in line as far as possible to make sure that the transfer around those issues can continue. As organ um, donation and transplant is a UK-wide um, mechanism, you know it's necessary for us all to be uh, working together on that. Um, so yes, there is an imperative that we work on that. Um, it, so, from that purpose, for the purpose of the the framework, it's not a UK or CTA arrangement. However, I understand that organs there is an element um, of bilateral within the CTA, the UK and Ireland, for organs itself. So it may be that in areas there will be little divergence in in these areas, and um, to maintain that cohesion. Okay. Okay, well, I suppose we'll, we'll have to keep a, a sharp eye on that in the, in the time ahead. Um, but listen, thank you for your presentations here today. Um, they, I agree, they have, been, they have been very interesting and a very useful engagement in that sense. And thank you for your responses in as far as possible to most of the questions and your commitment to provide us with any additional information that you weren't able to give us today. Um, I'd like to thank all of your officials online and also Cathy, yourself and Patricia, Thank you very much, and I wish you all a very, very happy and peaceful, and I hope everybody gets some sort of a break over Christmas, because I know you have all been working extremely hard in very challenging times, and uh, hopefully everyone will, will stay safe and then be able to enjoy Christmas within, within the limits of what is sensible, if not what is allowed. <laughs>
Thank, thank you, you. Okay. Chair. Chair, and if I could just uh, um, just thank the committee as well for um, I know that the the um, the support that you've given us in the last few months, in particular the scrutiny that you were able to apply in terms of the um, high volume and complexity of legislation that we've put in, in front of you. So thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Adam Orr. Slam. Okay, members. Um, so I had referred there earlier to, to the correspondence at tab 6.1. Are members content to note that correspondence at tab 6.1? Yeah, content. And members, if I could just return you at the end of at the end of the session with Karen Pat Pearson from the Executive Office, I had referenced a number of items of correspondence in in there, and I should have just officially asked our members content to note the correspondence at 12.11 and 12.14 of the pack, and the tab 12.7 to put 12.27 of table papers, and to note the visiting guidance at tab 12.9 of the pack. They were all discussed during that. Okay, thank you, members. So, members, we're going to go now to items seven or ten. I'm going to take a very quick break again, and we will come back there, uh, please, as close to 12:30 as we can, just to resume, and we'll get the officials on the line for that session. Thank you. Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. Okay, thank you, members, um, and we're back on back on uh, um, moving on now to item seven to ten. Uh, we're moving to consideration of three statutory rules regarding food standards, and a member of the Food Standards Agency is online to answer any questions that members might have in respect of these rules. So, we'd like to welcome Kathleen Baker. Kathleen Baker. Um, can you hear us there okay, Kathleen? Yes, thank you. I can hear you very well. Okay, thank you. Um, just one that I had in relation to this. In, in the principles of the Common Framework Programme, and specifically those relating to north-south linkages, uh, Kathleen, the Protocol and the Good Friday Agreement are mentioned in the memo at page 207. What will department officials do throughout the process to ensure that those principles are upheld? Apologies, Chair. Are you um, referring to the previous Department of Health brief or the statutory rules? Apologies. Just can it's I just ask for clarity? There was a, a common framework memo. Um, 
Common Framework Memo, Kathleen, and, and it said that the principles uh, that the, those written in north-south linkages, the protocol and the Good Friday Agreement, are mentioned within the, the Common Framework Memo. So I'm just wondering how officials will ensure that those principles are upheld throughout the Common Framework process. Apologies, Chair. I'm going to have to come back to you, to you in writing. Um, so I, I've come before the committee today around the particular SRs. Apologies. So don't have any of that information in front of me. But but if it's okay, can we come back to you in writing on that? Yeah, that, that, that actually yes, that, that that would be fine. So that's that's all I had uh, in relation to that. Um, a part, yeah, that, that that's fine, Catherine. We'll, yep. Any other questions in relation to the SRs members? Sure. Yeah, Jerry. Um, just quickly, the explanatory uh, memorandum um, says there was a four-week uh, consultation. Um, I don't know if we discussed this at a previous meeting. Maybe we did, but just um, how satisfied are you, uh, Kathleen, that that was sufficient enough? Okay, can you just tell me which particular um, statutory rule you're referring to, please? Yeah, this is the explanatory memorandum for SR uh, number 286. Is that yourself? Sure. Could you just give me the title, Uncle? It's okay. the food, the food miscellaneous amendments, etc. EU exit regulations NA twenty twenty. Catherine. Yes. No. Thank you very much. I know the one you're talking about. Yes. So, so this this particular regulation is in effect making um, quite a lot of technical fixes. Um, to, to, to regulations that we had made previously last year when we thought we were leaving under a no deal. So there had been a lot of amendments made to regulations so we could have a retained rule book outside the UK, or sorry, outside the EU. Now, um, obviously, once the details of the Northern Ireland Protocol were agreed earlier this year, um, those, those previous amendments um, were not relevant. So this particular regulation hasn't made any policy changes as such. It has simply reflected the fact that we need to revoke those rules and that we will continue to apply the EU regulatory requirements. Um, the only sort of um, slightly different, um, I suppose, um, interpretation of the EU rules that have been added into this particular regulation is around the identification mark and health marks for uh, products of animal origin. So we've been doing really an awful lot of consultation with industry um, outside the consultation period of the regulations themselves. So for about the last um, three months, we've been meeting very, very regularly with industry around this particular issue. Um, and, uh, you know, we have been dealing with a lot of questions as a result of that, and we've produced a Q&A guidance um, uh, on our website. So we, we have sort of mocked up a lot of the issues in that particular aspect um, with the industry directly within the consultation period, but in a much extended period um, outside of that. Okay, and you're happy that that, uh, I know there's only two responses, but that was sufficient based on the fact that the regulations are no longer required as you as you indicated are you happy that was sufficient yes um, we have the two responses um, one from the um, UFU um, and they they were um, uh, they agreed with the proposals um, because of uh, you know we just needed to 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 get we needed to revoke the regulations that had been made previously so they understood that and um, we have one person who responded from um, who is a honey producer who was making, uh, you know, putting forward issues around costs of labelling um, once we move outside the EU. And, and we have noted those um, and we'll consider those whenever we make any amendments in the future um, around honey labelling. However, we will continue to, to be following the EU rules in this respect anyway. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on that, members? Um, and I should have said in my introduction to Catherine Baker that Catherine's head of food safety policy and delivery with the Food Standards Agency. So, listen, I think that's all, Catherine. Thank you for coming on, even if even if only briefly, to, to pick up on those couple of points. Um, appreciate that, and uh, good luck and all the best. And very happy and peaceful Christmas to you. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm very happy to come and answer questions at any time. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Okay. Okay, members, I'll move on then to a uh, consideration of each of the individual SRs. Um, oh, yes, uh, the examiner of statutory rules. Then the advise, I, I can advise members the examiner of statutory rules has reported on these SRs and has no comments to make. All of these SRs are subject to the negative resolution procedure. So, having said that, then I'll move on to them individually. 
I refer members to papers at tab 7 of your pact, including the clerk's memo at tab 7.1. This SR makes technical amendments to the Food Hygiene Rating Act 2016. The committee considered the SL1 policy proposal for this SR on the 12th of November, and we agreed that it was content for the FSA to make the rule. Have members any further issues to raise in connection with that statutory rule? No. Uh, if not, can, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 267, the Food Hygiene Rating Act Amendment Regulations NA 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Are we content? Content. Thank you. Moving on then to SR 2020 forward slash 286, I refer members to papers at tab 8 of the pack. This SR revokes and amends certain other regulations in order to take account of the NA Ireland Protocol. The committee considered the SL1 policy proposal for this SR on the 12th of November and agreed that it was content for the FSA to make the SR. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? No, thank you. If not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 286, the Food Miscellaneous Amendments etc, EU Exit Regulations 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. Moving on to SR 2020 forward slash 291, I refer members to papers at tab 9 of your pack. This SR provides for the enforcement of EU regulations by making technical amendments to certain other regulations. The Committee considered the policy proposal for this SR at the meeting on the 26th of November, and we agreed that, that we were content with the proposed rule. So members of any further issues they wish to raise in connection with that statutory rule? No. Thank you, members. So can I ask members then to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 291, the Food and Feed Hygiene and Safety Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. So now, members, we'll move on to our consideration of two uh, further SRs on travel restrictions. Um, so these are in relation largely to Denmark. Uh, are members happy to move to, to take a look at those regulations into, or would they like to? The, we can get departmental officials if there are questions in relation to these SRs. So, members happy to move on to consideration? Okay. Okay then. So, we will then move to consideration of each of them, and I will just give a, a quick explanation of each. SR twenty twenty forward slash two eight eight, the health protection coronavirus. Travel from Denmark Revocation Regulations 2020, and I refer you members to tab 10 of the pack. This SR revokes two previous rules which prohibited the arrival in the north from, of vessels and aircraft travelling directly from Denmark. The examiner of statutory rules has reported that this SR is in breach of the 21 day rule, but that she is content for the department's reason for that breach. This SR is subject to negative resolution. Have members any further issues to wish to raise in connection with that statutory rule? No. If not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 288, the Health Protection Coronavirus Travel from Denmark Revocation Regulations NA 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Great. Thank you, members. Moving on to SR 2020 forward slash 289, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment number 24, regs, uh, NA, regulations NA 2020. This SR adds Aruba, Bhutan, Kiribati, Micronesia, Mongolia, Samoa, the Solomon Islands, Timor-Leste, Tonga and Vanuatu to the list of countries. <laughs> Core of my other members. I thought that was good too. Adds those countries to the list of countries and territories exempt from the requirement to self isolate for 14 days after arrival here in the north and omits Estonia and Latvia from that list. It also revokes previous amendments relating to travel from Denmark. 
The examiner of statutory rules has reported that this ASR is in breach of the 21-day rule, but that she is content for the department's reason for that breach. The ASR is subject to negative resolution. Have members any issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? No, thank you. And can I therefore ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 289, the Health Protection, Coronavirus, International Travel Amendment number 24, Regulations 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Yes, thank you, members. Okay, members, moving on then to correspondence. And I refer you there to your correspondence at tab 12 of the pack to the correspondence memo at tab 12.1 and to tab 12 of table papers. So there are a number of items that I wish to draw to members' attention. And uh, the first one is items 12.2 and 12.3, which are departmental responses regarding the statutory rule on the temporary modification of the children's social care regulations, which the committee recently considered. And committee members will recall that we had a fair amount of discussion with officials and, and some agreements in some commitments in relation to that issue. So just just uh, in terms of those two items of correspondence, would members be content to note item 12.2 pending further scrutiny of the COVID-19 Vulnerable Children and Young People's Plan, which we will be undertaking? And secondly, are members content to forward item 12.3 to the Children's Law Centre and NICI? Yeah. Members content with those? Okay. Item 12.15 then is correspondence from the Committee for Justice outlining its concerns that there may be a scrutiny deficit in relation to the health protection regulations as other departments are not always engaging with their committee when regulations uh, introduce changes in their policy areas. So any comment from members in relation to that? Okay, just to note then, members. Thank you. Uh, have members any further comments or proposals on any of the other items of correspondence? Chair, could I come in? Go ahead, Pat. Uh, it's on 12.4, uh, response from the Minister in regard to questions I asked about the hyponatremia case and particularly about the Claire Roberts case. Uh, and I had asked how many uh, people involved in that case had been referred to and were being investigated by the GMC. Now, the answer we got was an answer to a different question. The answer was in relation to those involved in the care of Claire Roberts. Uh, so I wonder, would it be possible to write back and ask for an answer to the question that was asked? Okay, are members content that we re -put that question? Yeah. Just refresh me what the question was, Chair. Yeah, do you have the do you, can you repeat what the question was, Pat? Uh, yes, uh, we would like to know how many uh, how many people have been referred to how many people who were involved in the case of Claire Roberts have been referred to the GMC and are currently being investigated? Yeah. Okay, so members, just just to clar just just to clarify the question, um, our members, sure. can have, yeah, go ahead, Paula. Um, I, I'm still awaiting a response from the health minister asking him how he's responding to the findings in O'Hara's report. So I'm just wondering, would it be possible to um, elaborate on on our response to that letter, or do you want me just to leave that separate? I just it's very much in line with what um, Pat is um, sort of angling and, and, and chasing as well. But I'm just saying that I think the question around responding to the findings, not just the recommendations, but the findings, would also be quite probing. Thank you. Okay. Are members content? Yeah. Thank you. Are members otherwise then content with the actions proposed on the correspondence memo? Yep, no other items to raise. Thank you, members. Moving on to table papers, there's one additional correspondence item in the table pack, which is item 12.26 from the Minister in relation to a private family law early resolution action programme, which is in development in conjunction with the Minister of Justice. This is intended to address issues around the cure of children after separation without resort to court action where that's possible. So I just are members content to note that correspondence? Yeah, thank you, members. 
Moving on then, members, to the Forward Work Programme. I refer you there to your tab 13.1 of the pack. Um, are members content to note the Forward Work Programme? Yep, members content. Thank you. Um, any other business members today? Okay. Date, time, and place of next meeting. Then um, I'm releasing that we, we, we are we are seeking to clarify the timing around the the briefing that has been offered by the minister on Tuesday coming. Um, we're we're not in a position just to, to confirm the time of that, but would members be happy enough that we would make our next meeting to be at the call of the chair? Content with that, members? Yeah. Did we get that arranged? Right. And we'll come back to you as soon as possible in relation to your arrangements, Fad. Sure, yeah, happy with that. Just if possible, can we can we request uh, cause, I mean the, the briefings have been with the Minister have been regular, but they've been quite sort of condensed and rushed because of obvious reasons. So if it's possible could we get a maybe a bit more than a, an hour, an hour and a half if possible. Uh, could that be requested or yeah, we have we have requested an hour and a half for this for this briefing and, and we're we're hoping to make that a fairly dedicated session to, to pick up on some of the issues. So uh, we'll come back as soon as as soon as we possibly can. So um and uh, okay members that that's it then I we will come back to you with further information on the next meeting. Thank you. Thanks. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.